The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Welcome to Deep Dive with the Institute for Justice. I'm Melanie Hildreth, and I'm here today with IJ President and General Counsel Scott Bullock and IJ Senior Attorney Bob McNamara. We're going to talk today about immunity. So immunity is a term that's probably familiar to deep dive listeners who have also listened to IJ's podcast, Short Circuit. Uh, It comes up a lot when they're talking about cases where someone feels that the government um, or a government official has violated their rights and they're going to the court and asking the court to hold that person accountable. For people who aren't familiar with immunity and the way that it plays out in those cases, Scott, do you mind starting us off with a little primer? Sure. Uh, I should probably start off by uh, reminding folks of how difficult it is to sue the government in general. Uh, And this is true for even our most basic uh, cases that we do at the Institute for Justice when we sue for what's called declaratory and injunctive relief. And that's basically when you're just asking a court to declare that what the government is doing is unconstitutional and to enjoin them, to stop them from enforcing that law. Uh, Because there's all kinds of things you have to overcome. The government has a presumption of constitutionality that works in its favor. They, of course, have the deep pockets of the taxpayer to draw upon. So it makes it very difficult for the average citizen to sue the government. Uh, And it's one of the reasons why a group like the Institute for Justice exists. It's one of the only ways that a person has to really vindicate their rights. On top of that, is the doctrine of immunity, which makes it in many instances almost insurmountable for people to hold government accountable and to get monetary damages, even when the government egregiously violates their rights. Uh, And there's all kinds of different doctrines of immunity. There's absolute immunity that typically applies to judges and and unfortunately to prosecutors. And then there's the doctrine of qualified immunity, which is what probably a lot of people are familiar with, which also makes it extremely difficult for uh, citizens to hold government officials accountable. And this is very different than what private citizens face. Uh, If you violate someone's rights or you hurt them in some way, you are held accountable uh, for it as just an average citizen. Not the case with the government. Government officials have immunity, and citizens then have to overcome that immunity. And so that's one of the reasons why we launched IJ's project on immunity and accountability. And it starts with a very simple but fundamental premise that if citizens must follow the law, which government always is reminding us citizens are obligated to follow the law, then government officials must follow the Constitution. And if they don't, they have to be held accountable for it. The idea that a government official could be completely immune or even partially immune for most people will probably sound kind of crazy in a government and in a system where the framers were clearly so conscientious about setting up checks and balances and and other ways to to kind of limit government's ability to infringe on people's rights. Well, it's right. I mean, there's there's the immunity doctrines are, are nowhere in the Constitution. They're basically judge-created doctrines that shield government officials from accountability. But you won't find it mentioned anywhere in the Constitution and really not in any laws. And most, uh, many laws like Section 1983 that some people might be familiar with actually give a right to citizens to sue the government to hold them accountable. So where if it's it's not in the Constitution, it's not in the law, and in fact, you know, the opposite's in the law. Where did this idea even come from? How are we in the place where we are now? I mean, it comes from the courts. I mean, the the modern doctrine of qualified immunity really starts in the early 1980s. In this case, called Harlow v. Fitzgerald, and the plaintiff in that case has a, had alleged sort of a, a vague, shadowy conspiracy. He was a government employee and said that a bunch of figures in the Nixon administration were conspiring with each other to prevent him from continuing in his job. Job. And the court is, is clearly uncomfortable with kind of the vagueness of the conspiracy that's being alleged. But the court also says, look, uh, even if all of this is true, uh, it's not totally clear to us whether this sort of activity is illegal in the first place. And we're not going to hold someone liable unless the constitutional rule they violated was clearly established. Uh, And in a certain sense, I think framed at that level of abstraction, the idea of qualified immunity appeals to a lot of people. 
Uh, if the Supreme Court is going to announce a brand new rule for the first time, it seems kind of unfair to say you're going to be liable for breaking this rule that literally no one knew about until we announced it just now. Uh, but that's not really what the doctrine means in practice. Uh, right. So how does it play out? There's some pretty crazy stories uh, of how this works for, for the average person interacting with government officials. Right. And so what the doctrine has morphed into since the 1980s is not just we're, we're going to let you off the hook if if we announce a brand new rule you couldn't possibly have known about, what it's morphed into is this idea that for a rule to be clearly established, you have to find a federal appellate case saying that exactly the conduct the government official engaged in, in exactly the circumstances he engaged in it in, uh, was unconstitutional. And if you don't have uh, a case on point, uh, the law can't be clearly established, and therefore you're entitled to qualified immunity. And it leads to absurd results. Uh, uh, there was one qualified immunity case where it was clearly established. There was an earlier appellate case that had held it was unconstitutional for the police to sick a dog on a surrendering suspect. And so someone else sued and said, well, I was surrendering and the police sicked their dog on me. And the appellate court actually said, well, the first guy was lying down. And you were seated with your hands in the air. And those are just different circumstances. And so the police are entitled to qualified immunity. Uh, it's literally the physical position. Uh, or in, in a separate case, uh, a property owner alleged that the police, while serving a warrant, just stole a bunch of money and rare coins, just kept it for themselves, just pocketed it, never delivered it to the evidence locker. And when the property owner sued, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, well, there's no case saying it violates the Constitution for the government to steal things from you. Uh, and so uh, we have to award qualified immunity. And the, the court in that case actually goes out of its way to say, like, we recognize, like, generally speaking, human society recognizes 2,000 years <laughs> of moral, moral traditions. That's right. <laughs> exactly. But, but there's no federal appellate case. And it's really this doctrine that it, it treats government officials as these sort of moral monsters who can only obtain instruction from published federal appellate decisions, which is not true. I mean, they're, they're not moral monsters. And it's also just not true that the only source of kind of moral or legal education is the published opinion of a federal appellate court. Uh, you know, the, the people who are supposed to teach you not to sick a dog on someone who's sitting down with their hands in the air are not the federal appellate courts. They're your mom and dad. That's just a thing we can all understand. And it's it, it should go. Um, it, it's different than uh, what the normal citizen faces, which is the reasonable person standard. That's right. what you face is what would a reasonable person um, act like in, in this set of circumstances. But Bob's absolutely right. Here, it's this question of is there clearly established an exactly on point precedent that gives the government officials fair notice about this? And the end result of this is really the erosion of incredibly important rights, uh, which I think is maybe best illustrated by Shanice West, who's an IJ client that we're representing right now in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and Shanice came home one day to find her house surrounded by five officers from the city of Caldwell Police Department. Uh, they had surrounded the house and they told her they were there looking for her ex-boyfriend. They asked if the ex-boyfriend was inside. And Shanice said no. I mean, he, he wasn't supposed to be. She hadn't been inside the house. She'd be surprised if he was there, but he's not supposed to be in there. Uh, and they ask if they can go in and, and apprehend him if he is there. So Shanice nods her head, hands them her keys, and leaves. Uh, but they don't use the keys. Instead of using the keys, they call in the SWAT team, set up a perimeter around Shanice's house, and engage in about a 10-hour standoff with the house, uh, where they spend a bunch of time launching tear gas grenades from shotguns through the walls and roof of the house. Uh, at the end of the day, they finally enter the house, they tear through the walls, and they realize that Shanice was telling the truth all along, that her ex-boyfriend wasn't in the house, and they've just engaged in a 10-hour standoff with a house that was empty except for Shanice's dog, Blue, uh, who, who survived. Unbelievably. Uh, um, but the house, well, Blue was okay, but the house was ruined. Uh, Shanice was homeless for two months. They had destroyed essentially all of her worldly goods. The house was uninhabitable. Uh, and... So she sued, and she sued because, generally speaking, if the government is going to come into your home, if it's going to seize your home or search your home in this way, it needs a warrant, right? That's a, a common bedrock property rights protection. If the government wants to come into your house, they need a warrant. Uh, and the government said, well, wait, wait, wait. We didn't need a warrant because we had your consent. We had your consent to go into your house. 
Now, no normal human being thinks consent to go into someone's house is the same thing as consent to destroy it from the outside. We've all invited people into our houses. We've had dinner parties. Our dinner parties are not a secret invitation to stand on my sidewalk and shoot grenades into my windows. Uh, But the appellate court looked at it and said, well, wait a minute. No one's ever made this argument before. No one has ever come into a federal court and said consent to go inside someone's home is the same thing as consent to blow it up from the outside. And so since there's no federal case on point telling us that consent to go inside isn't the same thing as consent to destroy, we have to award qualified immunity. Now, we're not saying what they did was reasonable. We're not saying that a competent person would think what they did was legal. We're just saying there's no case on point. And what that does is it takes what's supposed to be a tiny exception. Like there's this general warrant requirement and there's an exception to the warrant requirement when you have consent to go inside. And it says, okay, we're going to draw this narrow exception to your property rights, but the boundaries to that narrow exception are going to be governed by qualified immunity. Uh, So as long as the government manages to violate your rights in a way that nobody has thought of before, they're going to get off scot-free. And that means that any exception to property rights, any exception to a warrant requirement is going to be automatically boundless as long as you can come up with a new way to break the rules. And the perverse consequence of this, as Bob points out, is that the, the more outrageous the conduct, the more likely it is that the government is going to get immunity because nobody had ever thought to issue a decision about uh, this before. And right. so that that is just one of so many uh, problems with the doctrine. So – to a normal person, these examples are so absurd. You know, the the lying down versus standing up, the stealing coins, throwing grenades at somebody's house because you said that they could use a key to go in. Do you, do you get the sense as you've looked at, at these cases and other cases that judges are ever a little bit embarrassed to be taking these sorts of positions? You know, how do they justify to a normal person this whole concept, you know, the the idea that this is permissible? You absolutely get that impression, and I I think that's the reason the Ninth Circuit uh, in the coin theft case has a whole passage about how they understand that theft is wrong. Uh, And usually if you have to say out loud— We know better. The cops don't know better, but I know better. It it, it shows shame. Like The only reason to say that out loud (laughs) is you're a little bit ashamed of what the law is forcing you to do. But there are a number of opinions from lower court judges just openly saying this doesn't make any sense. Uh, I have no idea what it means to be clearly established. Uh, I just don't know what that means, and I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to apply the law the Supreme Court told me to apply, but I want to tell you up front, I don't know what that means, and I don't know what I'm doing. And what it leads to is essentially arbitrariness, uh, that it's sort of all within the discretion of the judges how closely a a previous case has to match the current case in front of them. Uh, Does it make a difference if someone was lying down or sitting down or standing up? What if they were touching their nose? And so there's no coherent way to predict in advance, this case will yield qualified immunity, this case will not yield qualified immunity. And so it results in a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty both for citizens and frankly for government officials and for courts, uh, and a lot of impunity, a lot of like clearly incorrect actions by government officials, things that no one will defend on their merits, that nonetheless don't yield any kind of actual accountability for the government or any kind of relief for the property owner or other people who've been victimized. So the final outrageous case, the example that you gave, the Shanice West case, is an IJ case. It's the first one of this kind of case that we took on. Scott, you mentioned earlier the project on immunity and accountability. Could you talk a little bit about why this is something that IJ decided to tackle and why now? Sure. Uh, This is something that uh, we started to encounter in some of our own cases, uh, too, where these doctrines were thrown at us, especially in the civil forfeiture context, where we have a number of cases challenging uh, civil forfeiture uh, for it. And it was also something that uh, myself and several other attorneys at IJ noticed was happening in the law. And um, uh, we said this is something that maybe a lot of the general public doesn't know about, but it's something that's so pernicious that it merits our attention. And we can look at it from a way that looks at first principles, too, to talk about um, the need for government accountability and why this doctrine is not well founded in the law uh, as well. And so we do what we often do in these situations. We take issues from uh, relative obscurity 
use all the tools of public interest law to shine a national spotlight uh, on them. And we have done that for eminent domain abuse and civil forfeiture and occupational licensing and educational uh, choice. And that's what we were determined to do with uh, qualified immunity uh, then as well. And so we started doing more research into this. We held a round table where we brought in practitioners in this area, academics, people who knew a lot uh, uh, about this. Um, We started developing develop our own expertise uh, through the filing of amicus uh, briefs in these cases uh, and really staking out our position uh, on this. As listeners of the Short Circuit podcast know, qualified immunity cases make up a large uh, percentage of the dockets of of federal courts. And so we started talking a lot more uh, about it in that forum. And then we said we're ready to uh, now go forward with original cases uh, on this. And so we launched it with the Shanice West case that Bob uh, talked about. Talked about, and now we have uh, several cert petitions before the court uh, on this. And the timing of it is really right uh, as well. As Bob mentioned, there is this growing consensus that this doctrine is, um, as I said, not grounded in the law and is leading to these horrible abuses of people's rights. And so it's almost reaching a tipping point where uh, the courts are going to have to address this, and we're providing them with great opportunities for them to take up the issue. And to the extent that people outside the legal system are looking at it, they're starting to look at it more skeptically as well. Wasn't Bernie San- didn't doesn't Bernie Sanders actually talk about this in some of his campaign? stump speeches. Well, and, and that's the other strength of this. And, and it's, it's true of so many IJ issues is there's this sort of consensus across the ideological spectrum that this is a real problem. Uh, so our friends at uh, Reason Magazine and the Cato Institute have been uh, speaking out uh, uh, about this and doing great work uh, there. Uh, just uh, Judge Don Willett, who was an appointee by uh, President Trump to the Fifth Circuit, has been outspoken uh, about the inequities of a qualified immunity. Justice Clarence Thomas uh, has also uh, spoken out about this, Justice Sotomayor. And then you have the uh, presidential, the platforms of people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren that also said something has to be done about qualified immunity. So that's always a really good sign. Potentially the only thing that National Review and Bernie Sanders agree on. That's right. And David French, who used to be at National Review, has written a lot uh, about this. So all these people that don't agree on a lot of other things say this is fundamentally wrong and something needs to be done about it. So where do we want the law to go? Where, what are we trying to get through these cases, through the advocacy, the education, the things that IJ is doing? Where do we want to end up, Bob? What we're trying to achieve is a, a system where courts can do what they're designed to do, which is hold the government accountable when the government violates the Constitution. The first step in having a limited government is actually enforcing the limitations on government. And in our country, those limitations come from the Constitution. And at bottom, I think this debate is a question about whether the, the Bill of Rights and the other amendments to the Constitution are empty promises on a piece of paper or whether they're meant to have meaningful effect in the real world. And if they're meant to have meaningful effect in the real world, that means courts have to be empowered to do something when you break them. And right now, in most situations, they're just not. Right now, the consequence to a government official who violates your property rights, your Fourth Amendment rights, your Fifth Amendment rights, your Fourteenth Amendment rights, is all too often going to be nothing. And not because what they did was okay, not because you weren't harmed, but just because it hasn't come up exactly like this before. And that's no way to run a railroad. That's just no way to have meaningful, enforceable protections for individual rights. And so what we're trying to do is move the debate and move the activity back to where it belongs, and that is on the Constitution and the deeply meaningful promises of individual liberty contained in the Constitution. So I'm going to throw a couple potential objections at you, and I want to get your responses to them. So if if somebody is is perhaps not totally sold on the idea that qualified immunity is crazy, one response might be, you know, from the perspective of the police, maybe, you know, if they don't have this assurance that they are going to be protected for behaviors where it's not clearly established, um, won't they change their behavior? Would they pull back? Would they not take action when maybe they should? And as a result, people could be hurt or property could be damaged or, or things could go badly in ways that they wouldn't 
you know, if the, the police had that assurance. So I, I can understand that concern, and I do hear that a lot, but I think that's also just a, a very strange way to think about how police officers conceive of their job. Like, I just have a hard time believing as a practical matter there is any government official, police officer or otherwise, who before they make a decision says, wait a minute, wasn't there an 11th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals decision on this four years ago? Uh, sort of the, the fiction of the qualified immunity doctrine is that that's how the police make their decisions. They're intimately familiar with the details of published federal appellate decisions and use them as their guide in all things. Uh, and it, it may be unfortunate news to the judges whose job it is to write those federal appellate decisions, but that that's not true. Uh, law enforcement doesn't know every jot and tittle of those opinions. And so it's not really giving any kind of assurance to government officials or to law enforcement to have this doctrine because they're not making their decisions based on those federal appellate decisions. Decisions. They're making their decisions based on what they think is reasonable in the moment. They're making their decisions based on their training and their competence. And what we're asking for is a standard that looks to their training and their competence. Uh, and I think Shanice West's case is a great example of this. The court in that case disavowed any holding that what these officers did was reasonable. They disavowed any holding that a competent officer could have understood consent to go into the home as consent to destroy it from the outside. And instead, they said the only question was this very technical quest for an on-point earlier published federal appellate decision. And we say the test should actually be competence. Would a reasonable officer in your shoes uh, have thought he was allowed to do what he was doing? Could a competent officer have made the decision that you made? And that actually provides a lot of leeway for the government already. Uh, in Many other areas of the law, the way we govern things is by asking, would a reasonable person have done what you did in that situation? That's how we govern everything from, from car accidents to slipping on ice. Would a reasonable person have done what you did in that situation? Uh, and that, for centuries, has proven to be a pretty good way of adjudicating things uh, without leaving us all in fear of what's going to happen in the event of a lawsuit. Uh, and that's really all we're asking for here. Uh, it's not that government officials have to be perfect. It's not that government officials can't uh, be required to make decisions. Uh, it's just that courts, instead of engaging in this artificial inquiry, courts have to look at whether the decision they actually made was reasonable. And that kind of get to Scott's point from earlier that this happens already for private citizens all the time, you know, that that's the way that courts look at things in those instances. Um, so other objection. Let's say then, again, that qualified immunity is curtailed, not on the table. You can hold government officials accountable for damages, and then they, they end up obligated to pay you money, perhaps the amount of money that you spent repairing your house after they shot a bunch of grenades into it. Um, who ends up bearing that cost? Like, could, couldn't there be some concern on the part of the ordinary taxpayer who had nothing to do with the grenades and would completely have agreed that they are unreasonable, feeling that they then are on the hook for this kind of crazy action that the government, you know, that the, the government decided to pursue? No, that's absolutely a valid concern. Uh, and fortunately, there's research on this. And what the research shows is that uh, these things are insurable. Uh, when a court does award damages to a property owner or a victim in these situations, that money doesn't come from the government officials, and it doesn't actually come from the government itself. It doesn't come out of the government's bottom line budget. It comes from insurance. Uh, these are insurable risks uh, that uh, can be covered by an insurer. And the idea of holding people liable is that one thing insurance companies are very good at doing is identifying risk. Uh, is identifying, you know, you should really maybe have a training program that says not to launch grenades into houses, because it turns out to be pretty expensive for us <laughs> when your guys launch grenades into houses. Uh, and shifting the burden from the individual victim whose constitutional rights have been violated to an insurance company uh, or to the government itself if it decides to forego the insurance company allows the, the liability to be in the hands of the people who actually have the power to stop the constitutional violations from happening. And so the goal is not for there to be a, a whole host of, of money judgments that people have to pay. The idea is to actually have fewer violations of the Constitution in the first place. Get them to stop doing what they've been doing. So, so Scott, what do you think our, our prospects are as you look at this? This is a very big challenge. Um, 
how do you foresee things playing out uh, over the next few years and, and perhaps even longer? Well, it is definitely an uphill battle, as all of our projects are at, at, at IJ. Uh, but as the old song says, there's something in the air. And and this is a, an issue that is it's really reaching a crescendo right now of concern uh, about this. As we mentioned, there's this widespread consensus across the ideological spectrum that something ought to be done uh, about this. And so uh, we feel like even though there's big challenges to this, courts don't like to reverse course uh, on many of these doctrines that have been established now for close to close to 40 years, we really feel like um, because of this consensus uh, that is being reached and the fact that this does not have any solid foundation in the law, that we're going to get some really good results from some of the cases that we're filing in the lower courts. And eventually, the Supreme Court is going to have to address this. And I think it's going to be relatively soon. Now, will they address everything in one opinion? Probably not. Uh, the courts typically like to work incrementally, uh, but we're going to look for every opportunity to give the Supreme Court and then the lower courts um, the ability to start curtailing this doctrine, to instill more accountability in uh, government officials, and to protect the rights of the average citizen. Well, thank you so much for, for being here and for taking the time to talk through this issue because it is a pretty complicated one. Uh, thank you, too, for joining us for a deep dive into IJ's work. You can get more episodes of this program wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube, and don't forget to subscribe. If there's an IJ issue you'd like to learn more about, email me at melanie at ij.org, and we may feature it in a future show. Mm-hmm.